Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode 449. I'm Kevin Coulson. And I'm George Conger. Today is October 20th, 2018. George, welcome to another show. How are you doing today? I'm doing great, Kevin. I had a, a, fir a first in 20 plus years of ministry. Oh. You know, priests uh, do all sorts of things. This past uh, Tuesday and Wednesday, I went and I dug up the graveyard at St. Stephen's Episcopal Church and moved the ashes of the dead to a new spot at Grace Episcopal Church in Ocala. Well, that's a so church that's my... closed, right? It's, it's not an active church, and it's a deconsecrated cemetery? Yes, and uh, okay. so I can now add to my resume of a grave digger. Uh, <sighs> actually, it was sort of fun. It was like those forensic TV shows because, you know, you have all these little strings and you're digging up, looking for bodies and stuff. It was a lot yeah. of fun. Conger CSI. Yeah, I got you. I got you. All right, so let's talk a little about the news going on. You saw the show I did with Gavin where we talked about... Like the... the uh, what? Like St. Stephen's Episcopal Church, the Church of England is basically a dead body in a graveyard, and we are going to be digging it up and playing We're with its bones. Digging up the Church of England. Oh, that's not going to go over well, George. All right. Yes, well, let's dig up the Church of England. We're going to talk about a bishop's letter. Um, the evangelical bishop sent a letter uh, kind of responding to the uh, letter of the churches from GAFCON that was issued at GAFCON 3. And in that... I want to talk about our Western response because it was really written, as Gavin told us, in English ease, where the English go into great depth to tell you what they don't want to tell you. And I thought you and I could talk, not paragraph like paragraph like Gavin and I did, but certainly talk about the feel of the letter and um, why they go so far to recognize why Gaff kind of exists and all that. And at the very end, kind of cut it all off and... Uh, um, burn their bridges with Gafcon. So, George, first, what, when did you first read the letter? Uh, I got the letter the night before it appeared on the Church of England Evangelical Council's website. Uh, uh -huh. Some of our friends in England sent me copies of it, and I received two or three different copies, one without the letterhead, one without the letterhead on the top, one without the signatures on the bottom, and finally the complete thing, because it looked like it was had been circulating before it was actually published so that you get more bishops to sign it and so different people receive different copies of it. So I, I got it, I read it, and I my initial response was very mixed because I have a small knowledge of the English world. I've been, I've been writing about the English church for over 20 years, so I know of or know almost all these people who wrote this letter, but I'm also an American. And, I'm, I, and my first response was, who do they think the audience is for this letter? Because well, if this is a letter that. to GAFCON, they have really cut their nose off to spite their face. Let's go back and, and talk about what you just mentioned. That we know people on this list on, on the, who wrote this letter. Not all of them are as pure as the driven snow and are really Welby's men. There's one fellow on this list, uh, one woman, so we're not talking about her, Jill Duff, but there's one fe one bishop on this list who is a horrible human being, uh, who is somebody, when I shake him, I have my other hand firmly planted on my wallet because I don't trust him that much. And here's, here's the difficult thing. Uh, he's not a godly man. He's a careerist. He is... Uh, not particularly honest, not particularly forthright, not particularly Christian. He really missed his calling in life to be a golf pro. You know, good teeth, nice smile, good personality, Christian depth, none whatsoever. To have a letter where you have someone like that sign it, who is in the pocket of Justin Welby, all the way out to people who are truly men and women of God who are fighting the good fight, means you've got to sacrifice something. And what was yeah. sacrificed was the integrity of this letter I, I think that's the, the main point here um, because we know from the the Church of England history and certainly the the history uh, in the Episcopal Church over the last 60 years what works and what doesn't work um, there's obviously in our history as a church some areas we can make some compromises on that really aren't salvation issues and we have done that we've you know 
obviously wanted to have a moderate voice. You go back to uh, the New Testament, you'll see the same thing. However, we know there's some things that just don't work, George. I guess the first thing I would say about this letter is being an American Episcopalian conservative, I can say with a clear conscience, been there, done that, it's not going to work. Kevin, you speculated last week that the uh, these bishops had a hint of what was coming in 2020 with the uh, eat, live, and die, or live well, eat well, whatever, <laughs> whatever this uh, Living, commission is. love, and faith uh, commission, yes. Okay. It sounds like a Julia Roberts movie. But <laughs> yes. the Julia, Julia Roberts movie that's coming out in 2020 is going to come up with, we're assuming, uh, pastoral uh, options to allow gay marriage, gay blessings, whatever it's going to be. But it, all the facts on the ground are that they will cave. And these bishops know it's coming. And so they have thrown out a lifeline to GAFCA. Well, in this lifeline, they've also decided, after they've thrown it out by writing this letter, they've decided to cut off the rope, to basically to denigrate GAFCON. So from an English perspective, we've had our viewers write to us, and we've had people closely associated with the letter saying, aren't these men brave? Aren't these men and women brave? Aren't they standing up? They're putting their head above the parapet. They're really standing and doing and do saying the right thing, and this is a way forward, being in but not of. And then at the same time, they basically write F U Gafcon. Uh, that they, they couch it in such language that any uh, desire for the international movement to come to the aid of these particular men and women, it's pretty slim because you've just insulted them to their face. Right now, you guys are looking at an image of Skylar. I'm a wonderful cat. Uh, he'll sit on my lap, he'll nudge us in the morning. But there's a bad side of Skylar too. You can pet Skylar all morning long, but at a certain mo moment in time, and there's not a, a moment of transition. There's just a moment of pure love from Skylar, and then the, the point where he'll turn around and he'll just bite you. It's called a Skylar bite. And that's what I see with this letter. We think Gafcon's great, we love you, and then at the very end, little bite, ouch. What's all that about, George? These men, these people aren't stupid. Well, one, one or two of them are. But uh, by and large, they're, they're not stupid. And the first thing that this letter tells me is the audience for this letter is entirely English. This letter was not written for the overseas Anglican world. Uh, it was not and, written for GAFCON, that's for sure. Yes. And so this letter was written to reassure the conservatives clergy and lay leaders, people in the pews, that these, that these bishops are going to fight the good fight. We're going to be loyal members of the Church of England, but we're going to stand on principles. We're not going to say what we're going to do. Now, as I've said, I've seen this in the Episcopal Church, and the results have not been pretty. The only way it works is what I would call the John Howe slash Benedict option. Central Florida is a happy, healthy, wonderful place for, within the Episcopal Church. We're growing. God is doing great things here. The Spirit is alive. How is that hap possible? By making us a fortress. You have a firewall between you and... We have a firewall. And what is that firewall? The clergy are very well screened. You get people moving from all across the Northeast. So all these people who voted for gay marriage in New York and Philadelphia, they eventually will move to Florida. And they'll pressure their clergy to come along, but guess what? Because of the firewall, the clergy are not. Uh, next week, Greg Brewer, our bishop, is going to give his public response to BO13, I think it was, the General Convention say. resolution saying that bishops no longer have the authority to prevent gay marriages from taking place. If a congregation wants to do it, and the priest and the leadership are in favor. The bishop has to permit this no matter what. We have a little clo close to 100 parishes. We probably have only one parish that is really hot to do this. Maybe four or five clergy who say, oh, well, if we're allowed to do this and there's a push, we may go along with it. You got 90, 85 to 90 who are saying, no, we're not going to go this way. 
And the test will be out for Bishop Brewer. What do we do with the one problem child? Do we basically say to the Diocese of Southeast Florida, here you are, here's a nice little island for you. We'll swap you this church for you know a future draft pick. Yeah, that's right. So, <laughs> There's got to be one so, or two but, you could but, trade. <laughs> so the, the point that I'm trying to say is that the only way this works, that the, the plan that they're talking about, is if you have the courage and the balls to basically be hard-nosed in your clergy deployment and how you allow what latitude you give on the local level. Sure. That's not possible in the Church of England. That's just yeah. not going to happen. From their national... Uh, clergy training program to the influence of the uh, church house over the individual diocese the Episcopal Church is so much more decentralized so this so from a practical perspective these 13 bishops thinking that they can somehow keep things together have a Benedict option for their particular diocese that that well, yeah. that, that train pulled out of the station when they <laughs> shot down the third province move that's not going to happen I don't think they can set up firewalls anymore. They've come, way, they've gone way beyond that ability, and like you said, that train is the train. You heard uh, uh, the Bonhoeffer uh, train analogy before. That train has left the station. You know, you're not going to be able to do that. Plus, so many of your clergy, if not a majority, are on the side of same-sex uh, um, marriage and stuff like that. It's it's not going to happen. George, we've watched uh, mutual flourishing. Uh, a desire of the Church of England, it's a failure. Um, dual integrity is within the Church of England, uh, a failure. Uh, within Atlantic Com Communion, maybe not yet. Um, what are honest options for these bishops? Well, there is, you know, uh, some form of the Benedict option, mm -hmm. which is, uh, you know, you basically create some sort of firewall. And there was this possibility, and that was the Third Province Movement. Third, yeah. Two provinces, Canterbury and York, a third non-geographic for traditionalists. Well, this was going to be negotiated with for Anglo-Catholics, and the Anglo-Catholics unfortunately folded. And it's now, I don't know if it's politically feasible to resurrect this, but they need to have some sort of guarantees. Because what we have seen in history, recent history in the United States and in the Church of England, that promises made are not kept. For instance, oh, gotcha. the uh, you know on the uh, people who hold views contrary to the ordination of women will not be penalized in any way. Well, guess how many people have made deans or archdeacons or bishops who have opposed the ordination of women since that Zero. day? Yeah. Well, one I think, but that was you know one of yeah. the flying bishops um, or Philip North up in uh, yeah. the north of England. The, and how many women and how many gays and how many other people have been made bishops and deans and uh, archdeacons. The promises were not kept. And now that uh, we're seeing, we're getting reports from English clergy who are finding they can't move out of their current yeah. parishes because deployment officers and, and the diocesan offices are saying, well, we really don't see you as a good fit here, which is a polite way of saying we don't want you're conservative. You're not welcome. Or orthodox views. No, it's agreed. Um, now we've had this. We've had see, and the English, for some of the English, they're all of a sudden waking. The English lion. You've been the tail has been tweaked for so long. It's finally about to roar. I think. See, in America, we've had that. I can remember in the late nineties. I was offered a job uh, in the uh, Diocese of Newark, and the bishop said no. I was offered a job in the Diocese of Southeast Florida, and the bishop said no. Uh, and each time I was told to my face that it was because of my theology. They did not want a, they're happy for weak, mild, little, little uh, token conservatives who are not going to cause any problems. They just don't want, they don't want, they don't want to, barn burner like me. Now that's been the norm in the Episcopal Church for over 25 years. And now the clergy in the Church of England are discovering, hey, that's happening to us too, but it's all being compressed into a shorter time frame. So what's the way forward, Kevin? I think that was your original question. 
Well, I don't you see one the, in the you, current structures. You, you brought up the Anglo Catholics have no alternative. They used to have the kind of a Anglican ordinary where they could uh, go to Rome. That's washed up. Who wants to go to Rome right now? Well, Francis has. You know, there's the ordinary was so lucky that it was done under Benedict's tenure, mm. because there was a depth degree of intellectual and moral and spiritual integrity that is absent under Francis. Um, the see the having trained in the Northeast and known and you know I studied at a Catholic seminary for two years before I got to go to an Episcopal one. The phenomena of crazy nuns has been known to me for 25 years. So hearing about all these things and the all these innovations, this is not surprising to anybody uh, who has been closely following the Catholic scene. The Roman Catholic Church in the United States, with few notable exceptions, the Archbishop of Philadelphia, for instance, is intellectually, theologically, on the same plane as the Episcopal Church on these hot-button issues gay marriage and things. They just haven't gotten around to it because the old popes wouldn't let them. Nope. Maybe the new one will. We don't know. Okay. And let's transition in. Uh, there's no longer the orthodox option um, for many. See, I uh, can't grow a beard. You could, Kevin. You could. Because you have really facial well. hair. I'm, I'm, well, I'm challenged in that aspect. One of my first Episcopal friends, and we're going back here to 1990, 1991, uh, say, hey, I'm called, I'm going to go to Virginia Theological Summer, I'm going to become a priest, I'll move back to Alabama, and I'll, I'll work within the diocese and stuff like that. Um, he ended up going to uh, VTS, got his uh, degree, uh, was made a priest by the Bishop of Alabama, he transferred to Tennessee, and he lasted about four months in a very liberal Episcopal parish. And he calls me up, and he he's an Orthodox priest. Uh, he's he joined the Orthodox Church. They didn't make him a priest. Uh, apparently, that's they, they don't take transfer papers from the Episcopal Church <laughs> for some reason. And for him, that was a viable. We option. hadn't grown a beard I've, yet, so yeah. And I've had other friends uh, who've done that too. I, I I don't have any friends who went to Rome, uh, but I've had several friends who went Orthodox. But now my friends who you know are in the Orthodox Church want to get out. You know, they said, you know, all, you know, it's just as crappy there, just as s itty there um, as it is anywhere, but they hide it better. Um, and, and, you know, they keep all their politics undercover. They keep all their divisiveness and stuff like that undercover. But now, boom, over in Russia, things aren't so uh, hidden anymore, George. The... Orthodox world is going through a crisis just as bad as the Anglican world, um, and that the uh, pa Russian Orthodox Church, the biggest one, is no longer in communion with the Ecumenical Patriarch. In other words, you can, uh, its clergy cannot celebrate, concelebrate with uh, Constantinople clergy. Your parishioners cannot go to another church. It's they're they're. And it's over the independence of uh, or the autocephalacy of Ukraine. Uh, we've reported on, we've kept out of commenting on the issues. We've reported the original documents, but we've tried to stay clear because I can see both sides of this argument, and it's not going to get resolved in our lifetime. Uh, <laughs> well, it's a very difficult because it's an action that was that occurred, but I can't really decipher if it's truly theological. Or if it's truly just a political thing, because uh, somebody got uh, re-put into the church that, that nobody wanted in the church, and um, it, it's hard to read what the original cause was. Is this politics or is this theology? Well, the net effect is that potentially a third of the Russian Orthodox Church's parishes and people will now be in another church, mm -hmm. um, the Ukrainian Orthodox Church, with right. its headquarters in Kiev. In the 1600s, the ecumenical patriarch in Constantinople said, okay, Ukraine, you're under the Russians. The Bartholomew, the current patriarch, says, I'm rescinding that. That's expired. You're now independent again, just as the Orthodox Church of uh, Poland or mm -hmm. Serbia and places like that are. You're your own freestanding church. Now, there's issues within issues. Um, there are 
currently two Orthodox churches. They've got to figure out how to merge. There's the Greek Catholic Church, which are the Ukrainians who are under the Roman Catholic Church. They're not part of this deal. And then there's the Russian Orthodox Church, who still has adherents in the Ukraine. And it's not being helped by both sides are being bad. For instance, in the Donbass and in the eastern Ukraine, currently occupied by Russian troops and militias, non-Russian Orthodox churches are being forcibly closed, including Baptist ones. Mm -hmm. uh, and basically, you're either affiliated with Moscow or you're out of here. And in the Ukraine itself, uh, Ukrainian nationalists are attacking uh, people who are staying in the Russian Orthodox churches in the Ukraine as being agents of, of an alien power. So the theological issues, which I'm not, which the, the Orthodox uh, can argue ad nauseum, and which I'm not going to be able to resolve or even comment on faithfully, have been overshadowed by the international geopolitical issues of the conflict between Russia and Ukraine. And that sort of ethnic tension and tribalism is one of the major problems of orthodoxy in the United States, that the Greeks don't get along with uh, the Ukrainians and so on and so on and so forth. It's, the church is a fallen and broken institution, did not it? Uh, sometimes it's great being an Episcopalian because our faults are so self-obvious and evident. We just make sure everybody knows about it. That's right. But as you say, well, Kevin, you know, I, I, well, I, I want to just interject here. Has there been any time in the last 600 years that the church has been in this sour state? You know, uh, there's disunity everywhere. Um, well, we yeah, had... I, I, there's no solid denomination anymore. Uh, when I went to the Anglican Orthodox conference that was held in a show to house, I was reminded by all the Orthodox ordinance there who were uh, going to go and become priest that the Orthodox Church is never divided, Kevin. You know, you Anglicans and you Roman Catholics, you divide every other day, but the Orthodox Church has not divided ever. Uh, I don't think they call it the Byzantine times. Um, and we will never divide. We are always going to be together. And I don't know if that's kind of pride before the fall uh, or whatever, but that's changed. And now the whole, you know, Christian world is in a place where the church is sour. I, what, I can't you know, sell the Roman I Catholic have, Church. I can't sell the Lutheran, Anglican, Evangelicals. It, it's horrid. And I think one thing that I, I need to touch on, which at this point, uh, YouTube censors don't look because we may tread upon a topic that will cause us to be banned. Yes, again. In writing and doing news reporting, I necessarily do a lot of stories about Bishop's moral failings. And, you know, the whole Cardinal McCarrick controversies, I've, I've not gotten too heavily involved other than reporting on the documents and the general and how it affects the Protestant world. Essentially, that's a gay issue. Um, I have written stories about the Orthodox bishop, an Orthodox bishop in Serbia, who was bounced out because he was sexually abusing seminarians, and that homosexuality is an, has been a problem within the Orthodox episcopate in a number of countries. This past week, I wrote one of the sad, I had one of the saddest stories, and I didn't even write about it. I just reprinted the letter from the bishop of New York. Paul Moore was one of the great Episcopal bishops of the 20th century. Paul Moore was the sort of person that your grandmother would look at and say, that's an Episcopal bishop. 1941, a Princeton graduate, he volunteers the Marine Corps, wins the Navy Cross and the Silver Star, gets a bullet in his lung in Guadalcanal, you know, just a war hero, comes back, joins the, becomes a priest in the Episcopal Church, serves in the inner city, rises through the ranks, Dean of the Cathedral, you know, Assistant Bishop in Washington, comes Bishop of New York, and was there for almost 20 years. And I know a great many priests who were mentored and trained and raised up by Bishop Moore. And Bishop Moore was from a very prominent, socially connected, wealthy family. He was, if you will, Episcopal Bishop from Central Cast. The Bishop of New York, Andrew Dicci, released a letter last week saying, 
anybody who was sexually molested by Bishop Moore, please contact me. Now, there have been stories, and his daughter wrote a nasty book about her father, but this is the first time that there has been a net confirmation that Bishop Moore repeatedly, serially abused, sexually abused young men and women who came to him to be prepared for priesthood. Yeah, now, it's... I, that, I, now, that is, a, it is so destructive, because New York, with love it or hate it, folks, it's one of the tip-top places in the United States. Mm-hmm. It, its bishop is always going to be in the news. Its bishop is always going to be a person of prominence. And we have our own McCarrick story in the Episcopal Church with Paul Moore. And the Orthodox have had a similar stories like that. And even look at Willow Creek, for goodness sakes, where its pastor has uh, had resigned in infamy and Willow Creek is on the point of implosion because of sexual misconduct. And I don't know if Willow Creek had a gay angle to it, but the Anglican and the Orthodox and the Catholic ones are all instances of homosexual abuse and homosexual activity. What is it with our society that it's not, it's not just an Episcopal problem? It's not a Catholic problem. It's not just an Orthodox problem or a Lutheran problem. You know, it's a sin problem. Uh, none are righteous. None. And uh, leave it to the church to prove it. it, it it's really sad. Um, can, can I, I, can I just... Out. Yeah, sure. Interject. Want, That's what you're here for. Uh, we, I, didn't, I didn't answer something um, huh. fully. I shared this with a few people at GAFCON in Jerusalem because they asked the English delegations, well, what do we do? What do we do? Mm-hmm. And about the problem in England. And I told them what to do. But they're not going to do it because it's too American of a response. There, too there's Maverick. several... There's several. Oh, it's it's rude. Uh, there's several English dioceses that are on the verge of financial collapse. Mm-hmm. All you have to do is identify who gives what and where's the money is coming from, and you basically put pressure to shut off the spigot. So if you've got a diocese that five wealthy evangelical propped parishes, basically the difference between bankruptcy and keeping on, keeping on. You find a way to cut off the money flow. That works. That's why they, that, we've had all the lawsuits in the Episcopal Church, because that is the silver bullet that will kill Dracula, money. And the English do not have a dentist can. So, no, they don't. Property is property. So, so you're not compelled to give money. It's um, the way you are in the United States in the Episcopal Church. You get your well, accounts just, out and find out where the weaknesses are and force your your competitor into bankruptcy. Do what Donald Trump would do. Yeah, that's right. Uh, you brought up the Episcopal Church. Uh, somebody has d- decided to play the long game. I don't know if you've been watching the news lately, but uh, apparently Arizona and West Texas are asking uh, the 815, the headquarters, to forgive some of their... Um, uh, maybe not forget, but they don't want to go to fifteen percent right away. The 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 new calm in in eight fifteen is the the assessment for our diocese is fifteen percent. Obviously, there's some very impoverished dioceses that can't pay it. There's some uh, dioceses outside the country who will automatically be forgiven because it's too impoverished down there. Um, but there's some very wealthy dioceses who are asking forgiveness, and it seems that the Episcopal Church may want to play the long game here and say, okay. You don't have to give us 15% now, but as long as you're working toward it, we're not going to send Uncle Vinny down to visit you. Uh, are you seeing this as well? Yes. In fact, uh, this is uh, an important story that needs to be gotten out into the Episcopal world. Six dioceses asked the, stand, uh, the, the Standing Committee of the Episcopal Church, so, yep. Executive mm-hmm. Council, to be for relief on their mandatory 15% assessment. Four of these dioceses are basically four dioceses, Haiti, the Virgin Islands. They just don't have the money. Two of them are normal, wealthy, functioning dioceses, West Texas and Arizona. Arizona has been in arrears for years and years and years and had basically dysfunctional management. And they basically asked for, can we have all our past indebtedness forgiven and we'll go forward and pay our fair share from this point forward. 
And so that was that really was a financial thing because they'd have to come up with a huge sum to pay off their credit card bills to the National Church. West Texas was an interesting case. West Texas is a wealthy diocese. It can afford two bishops. It has an endowment fund. It's San Antonio and the south of Texas and out to, uh, not to El Paso, but just before El Paso. Um, part of the country doing very well economically. They were paying 6% of their income, and now they have to pay 15%, and they couldn't just make that jump. And it wasn't because they don't have the money, but because their parishes were, went, whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> Wait a minute. <laughs> Wait a minute. We've got to cough, come up with all this extra cash to send to New York. What are you talking about? Uh -huh. Now, my diocese uh, has gone from 10 to a 12% assessment to, make, to meet this request. And we've been able to do it. Um, where, uh, but it's caused some grumbling. West Texas, they've said, look, if you push us too hard right now, things are going to fall apart because we just cannot compel people to co cough up the cash to make it work. And so the executive council said, okay, should we encourage West Texas to move towards getting on board or since they have all this money because they have two bishops and an endowment fund, they got the cash. Maybe if we just shake them down a little bit more. And by a vote of 14 to 16, the executive council voted to give them a break. And Kevin, that is entirely due to the mindset of the new presiding bishop. And the office, Catherine, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Catherine Jeffrey Shorey world, it was shake down, you know, pay to play. Well, I think uh, they had perfect. Guido on their speed dial back in, in those days. Yeah. The, the, the National Church was run by David Booth Beers and the lawyers. Now, mm -hmm. I believe that they, that was it was for their financial benefit that they did all this, that all the lawsuits, which went through their law firm. He, he, uh, uh, Alan Haley has addressed this, but it is ethically it's questionable to advise your client as an, to, to, advi uh, to be chancellor of a, a company to advise your client to sue people and then retain your personal law firm to sue them because you're a partner and you get a cut of the proceeds from the fees. Well, sure. Curry is either a very, very, very deep, clever man, and he's playing a long game that we can't quite see, or he actually means that he wants to move out of the nasty world. But still, Kevin, it was a close vote, 14 to 16. Yeah, that's way too close. But we shall see what happens within the Episcopal Church. Uh, okay, we're at the end of the program. Clearly, we've given you horrid news about the Universal Church. You need to be praying. Uh, because right now, the world that you want to reach sees really bad news about the church and has no desire to join it, participate with it, work with it, or help it. And you need to be praying about that. You need to pray that the, the church can reform. Every church, the Roman Catholics, the Anglicans, uh, the Lutherans, the Orthodox. It, it's time, you know, for a, a, a reboot, so to speak. It, it, it's hard to watch. You have another option, Kevin. Oh, Benedict? No, move to, to Florida. Move to Florida. <laughs> move to Florida. At the end of the program, I like to have audience participation. If you would like this show, click the like button either on YouTube or Facebook uh, or both if you really liked it. Uh, please share this program with your friends. That would make you the rebel. You need to share it with them before they share it with you just to show you you're, you're an upstanding young Anglican. Um, we get lots of play in the universities. Uh, if you want to, uh, in the show to house, seminarians and Trinity watch us uh, regularly. Share us amongst your classmates for those who have not uh, seen it yet uh, subscribe now we have lots of subscribers I think you know we're at least 60% of you who watch have subscribed but if you haven't subscribed yet it's time to for those high-minded young Millennials we offer a podcast so if you go to the show notes on YouTube you're gonna see a link to the uh, podcast you can certainly uh, subscribe and share that with your young Millennial friends it's a good show I'm Kevin Coulson and I'm George Conger, and you've been watching episode 449 of Anglican Unscripted.